It's good to okay. see you all. We're going to go ahead and start up uh, uh, session number two. Uh, for years, I pastored where I had multiple churches in the morning, and this past year, I'm, I have one church that I serve. And so I'm having to get back in the habit here just this afternoon of doing uh, speaking twice uh, and all. I'm having to relearn that uh, real quick. But it's really good to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, I am, my name is Travis Walker. And I am the Congregational Resource Minister for the ESCO District. I'm new into this position this year. Um, I forgot to address it in the first session, but I'll share a bit here. The Congregational Resource Minister, because uh, I've been asked several times, you know, what, what do I do? Well, if you have a question, ask me and I can let you know. Uh, really, I'm just, I would say, primarily here to support. Uh, be another person you can call if you have questions. Uh, about things going on in the life of the church. If you're looking at new ways of connecting with your community and you'd like to brainstorm some ways, uh, I'm a person you can call to talk with about that. If you're looking at maybe making some improvements uh, on your building and you have questions about that, maybe it's audiovisual or maybe disability access, uh, you're welcome to give me a call. I can uh, connect you with some resources. And I would say one of the things I've been focused on this year is grants in regards to disability access. So if you have a bathroom or an entryway or something that uh, needs to have some improvement where folks can make it into the building, uh, let me know as there are several foundations right now that are interested in that support uh, for congregations. And I think that's a good thing right there. Um, other things I can help with, um, your uh, visioning for churches, that's another thing I can help with. If you have questions on paperwork that need to be done, this is probably more for the pastors in the room right there, especially we just got done with church conference season, but if you ever have questions about any paperwork or insurance, you're always welcome to give me a call and uh, can walk you through or talk about that for a bit. Um, it's really an interesting uh, position. It's, it's one unlike anything I've ever uh, been in before, and I'm learning as I'm going. So I would say, challenge me. Let's find out where my limits of knowledge are. I'd like to find that out. So feel free to call anytime. And the other hat I wear is I'm the pastor at the Wiley United Methodist Church, which is in Wiley, Colorado. If you're not sure where Wiley is, uh, if you know where Lamar, Colorado is, Wiley is about 10 miles northwest uh, of Lamar. Uh, it's a metropolis of about 350 people. I live in the urban core of, of Wiley, right in the middle of town. Uh, and then my other half, my wife, uh, she is the pastor of the Lamar United Methodist Church and the Two Buttes United Methodist Church. Uh, so we're a clergy couple uh, serving and living there in Wiley. Well, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about the joy of being. And this is a, an opportunity to kind of reflect on spiritual practices to support this. And we'll kind of build this idea uh, together. If you go to my next slide, uh, that'd be great. Uh, the folks upstairs are helping me out. They are running the, the PowerPoint for me. So at moments if I say next slide, just randomly, it's they're helping me out. So just give you a heads up on that. They're not you know, having a moment or anything. Uh, so we'll be looking at a couple of things here this afternoon. Uh, you know, what is joy? You know, we'll kind of explore that. And then we'll also uh, uh, tickle the, the intellect and those who are a little bit more on the philosophically inclined of what is being. And then we'll synthesize these two ideas together and, and look at how we can incorporate the joy of being into our everyday life, how we can use spiritual practices to support having joy in our being in our life. So that's what we'll be looking at this afternoon. So before we go any further though, we'll jump into the next section here, this first section on what is joy. How many folks in here, I would say, uh, lead your spiritual life more with your, your intellect, with the, the gray matter between your ears? Anyone willing to admit that? I'm one of those folks right there. So I, I hear you right there. How many folks here uh, lead with your heart? in your spiritual life. Well, okay, a lot of Methodists in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, the heart, you know, you feel those connections more, maybe more relational um, in that, and you just kind of feel it here. Now, I have to clarify my next question on this, because I asked it, and it got responses I wasn't quite expecting. But how many of you are more, like, instinctual, kind of, you, you, you come to a decision quickly, uh, you lead with your gut? How many of those folks? Because I put lead with your gut first and 
that got different responses there. Um, I, I mean, I love a good potluck, don't get me wrong, you know, right there. Uh, but some folks, you know, approach their spiritual lives, you know, just from the gut. You know, you have those strong, you know, feelings, you re react to them, uh, you go forward with them. And so uh, these are kind of you know, three places I feel that folks can experience faith and their spiritual practices. Um, Again, I'm more inclined to more like intellectual reading, those kinds of practices. But I found some of my biggest growth is when I examine my heart and I look more here or more from here. And there's other ways we can embody uh, faith and spiritual practice as well, but just to help you kind of start thinking about all these ways in which we connect with our faith. Uh, but when you hear the word joy, what comes to mind? Bishop Karen did a great job, lovely message this morning, kind of setting us up for this here. In fact, when I heard her, you know, hearing her preach, and I was like, oh, thank you, Bishop. You made my afternoon easier. Uh, <laughs> but when you hear the word joy, what comes to mind? Happiness. What else? Contentment. What else? Connectedness, family, warmth. Yeah. Anything else? Light, lighthearted, yeah. Peace, yeah. There's a, a lot of words we can incorporate with joy. Uh, I'll take a volunteer here. I'd love to have a volunteer read out of Isaiah for me. Isaiah in chapter 55, verses 12 through 13. Anybody would like to get that? I can pull it up real quick. Do you, do you have one with you? No? Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Isaiah 55. And so all these ideas that we have about um, you know, joy, uh, part of our work as a people of faith is really turning back um, to our scriptures. Uh, I was, this last month, I had the opportunity to speak about the Wesleyan Quadrilateral with several of our young people at a confirmation retreat in one of those Parts of that, you know, how we do theology is we start with scripture there. So I'd like to read that for me here. 55, 12 through 13. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees in the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up in the cypress. Instead of the beer shall come up in the myrtle and it shall be to the Lord a memorial for an everlasting sign that you shall not be cut off. Thank you, I appreciate that, thank you very much. Uh, and so that picture of scripture right there, for me, paints that picture of joy. You know, that connectedness going forward, the mountains and the hills. I think of that song in the faith we sing, that the trees of the field, you know, stands out to me right there, um, but also reminds of connection. We're not cut off. So joy connects you know, on so many different levels, but it, you know, it's scriptural that we experience joy, that we have that in our faith. Let's go to the next slide here real quick. And so Bishop Karen you know, mentioned that you know, joy really is more of an outlook um, or way of looking at the world. And when she said, kind of said something very similar, I thought that is perfectly in my PowerPoint today. Uh, but joy really is an outlook. It's uh, uh, rather than just feeling an instantaneous like moment, it's looking outward, you know, big scale, kind of how we exist in the world, how we operate in the world it comes from a place of joy. Um, I also think about how joy reflects that hope and connection that we have with God, uh, even when things are tough. Uh, I think about church musicians, a lot of church uh, works that are written on joy, especially liturgical pieces, uh, have, um, you know, are written in a minor key. When they're talking about joy. And if you know a little bit about music, if you don't, that's okay. Minor keys are often used if you want to make something feel a bit unsettled or uncertain or maybe a little bit darker, or a little bit different. Uh, I used to be able to do the exercise where you could you know, sing Row, Row Your Boat in a major key and then do a minor key because I took a, some music classes at one point. Can't, I'm not going to do that today for you, don't worry. But it really changes if you go into a minor key. 
But I think what's amazing about joy when we express it that way and think about that, even though things might be unsettled, might be a little dark, maybe a little discouraging or a little weird even, we still have joy. Joy is still with us as we move forward as a people. So let's move on and tickle our, our intellect here for a little bit. And for those who might be a little more philosophically inclined, uh, think about being. And this is, can be kind of a challenge for us. I'll go to our next slide there. Thank you so much. Because uh, it really reflects to our existence. So many people, theologians, uh, philosophers, have tried to address, you know, what does it mean to be, to exist, to be in the world? But being... You know is our existence we are here we're living entities the cells in our body are going through you know mitosis they're splitting they're reproducing we are taking oxygen in and we are expiring carbon dioxide we're digesting our lovely lovely lunch from earlier like there are things happening in us that are living and that's a part of who we are but we also exist in the present moment. We're here in a, in a present time. If we want to get real, uh, you, know, you know, speaking of like physics or think about how Einstein might talk about the world, you know, we exist in space time. You know, space and time and space time. But I also think there's something more practical about this though. It's not just, you know, way out there stuff. They also, these things matter to us in our every day. How many folks in here are overthinkers? You know, you know, the folks who think about the things you've done in the past or maybe the last conversation you have, you replay that conversation or you replay what you did like four, five, six, 80 times and you keep coming back to it. Well, that's a, and I'm one of those, like I am right with you there, my, my fellow overthinkers. Um, you know, that draws me backwards. It pulls me out of the present moment makes me go backwards how many folks do i have in here are would say worry about the future or inclined to worry got a few that's all right that is all right uh you know there's plenty of things to be worried about in the future there's plenty of things that we don't know what's going to happen next i mean we may have on our calendar what we're going to be doing on tuesday but if we're really honest, we don't really know what is going to happen on Tuesday. Like for all we know, um, there could be a great sale on chicken wings and that throws our whole schedule off because traffic gets all crazy for people shopping for chicken wings. Or perhaps we're seeking it out and we weren't planning on it. There's so many things that are beyond our control. But this is where I think our faith can be incredibly powerful. I think about that passage out of Matthew when Jesus was you know, teaching, talking about worry, you know, the passage I'm talking about here. You know, Consider the, you know, the lilies of the field. They were not as clothed as Solomon was in his glory. Consider the birds of the air and they are cared for. And how, consider you, you, know, you are so much more valuable than all these things. You know, so do not worry about tomorrow. I think these are natural things as humans that we worry about, you know, what is coming, the future. We worry about the past. But we have an amazing gift, an amazing ability, you know, a gift to be in the present moment. And so let's... Uh, Move on to the next slide right here. So considering all these things, uh, when you hear the word being, what comes to mind? What stands out to you? Soul. I like that. The what? Presence. Anything else? I have one mentioned earlier with, was human. I thought that was kind of a human being. It was kind of a, also an interesting way to think about that. I, I think reflecting on being is important as well for us as a people of faith because it's, it's an act of faith, of being present. It's hard to have a conversation with somebody you really care about if you're thinking about your grocery list or you're thinking about that football game you just watched. Now, those are examples there, but we can think about deeper things that can pull us out of the present 
moment. And so being present as an act of faith uh, helps us to be open to the Holy Spirit, open to that connection that we have with our God in this moment, and also what the Holy Spirit is speaking and moving in us. So it's important to, to be present. I think about Psalm 46 uh, in, in, when reflecting on this, that be still and know that I am God, 4610. How many folks in here are not people who like to sit still? My people. Like, I don't like to be sitting still either. I know people who, I mean, have, have the patience, who can, you know, be reflective and quiet. If I have, you know, five minutes that's not on my calendar scheduled, I start panicking because I'm afraid of like, what's gonna fill up that vacuum on my calendar right there? You know, how's it gonna get filled? You know, that's pulling me out of the present moment, that worry, that anxiety. But being present is an act of faith. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about Sabbath as a spiritual practice, but you know, having that time where we can be present and be reminded that God is at work in the world and that we're not the ones who have to control the world. God is at work. It can be life-giving to be reminded of that. And so if we synthesize that, if you can move to the next slide there, you know, synthesize these things, that uh, the joy of being you know, is that act of faith. Finding joy here in the present moment uh, is you know, a way of saying, I have faith in God. I have faith in Christ. I have faith in the Holy Spirit. Might even get, you know, if you're really liturgical there, maybe you could write, you know, a, a, like a statement of faith and recite it in worship that grounds us you know, in that joy of being as an act of faith. I also think it's an act of, of witness, of finding joy in the present moment as an act of witness. And I think about this, especially considering that we're in an election year, it's 2024, and each and every one of us in one way or other are going to be exposed to so many uh, advertisements and stories, you name it, that are going to try to prey on our anxieties, to prey on our fears. And imagine how, what a witness it can be that as a people of faith, we say, you know, I am finding joy in this moment. The fears, the anxieties, the worries of the world don't have power over me. I have faith in our God who's with us. And kind of coupled with that, I kind of see this as an act of defiance in a way, but not in an act of defiance of like, you know, siblings trying to you know, poke each other in the car and try to, you know, you know, really get under the nerves of you know, mom and dad, but rather speaking out against, you know, those forces of evil that want to, you know, cause us to focus on our fear, our worries, instead of being focused on the hope that we have in God. I believe it can be an incredibly powerful you know, act of witness and, and defiance against the brokenness of the world by finding joy in the present moment, finding joy in being. And so it's an act of hope as well. Uh, I remember a mentor years ago who was, you know, talked to me, started saying, you know, like, you know, I don't understand why people in the church are always so anxious about change and things being different, you know, in the church or outside. And I was like, where are you going with this? Uh, as he was, you know, starting getting really fired up. And he's like, well, we know as Christians, you know, you know the end of the story, you know, we have that hope of everlasting life. We have that hope of peace, of a, of a new beginning, of, you know, the, the new heaven and new earth. Like, we know the end of the story. And so I see that finding joy in our present moment, that joy of being, is that act of hope. It can carry us forward as well. So there's a couple of thoughts right there as we're kind of going through this. Uh, any other thoughts, you know, of what, you know, the joy of being could be an act of blank. Any other thoughts? What you got? Purpose, Purpose yes. Oh my goodness, amen. Absolutely, finding that purpose there for the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Any other thoughts? 
Surrender, an act of surrender, yes, absolutely. Anything else? Well, feel free to keep synthesizing that. I know, uh, I don't know about you all, but I'm an afternoon napper, and this is getting into my like afternoon rest time, so I am feeling it too and all. But one of the talks about things about or things I wanted to focus on with today's talk is, you know, finding those spiritual practices that can help, you know, find that joy of being, finding joy in the present moment of, of really connecting us with our God. And so I am, you kind of are going to find here that I don't have a whole lot of formal experience doing like formal presentations on spiritual practices. A lot of my like instruction or advice or thoughts on um, spiritual practices come from like one-on-one -on -one conversations or just things you know, I've incorporated with. Uh, and so uh, when I was putting this together, I kind of grouped things into like three categories and they're not the best categories in the world, but they're useful for our conversation, or at least organizing thought, is we have conventional practices. Like if you went and like Googled spirit, Christian spiritual practices, know what would come up. And so I kind of lumped that into conventional. I lumped uh, kind of being creative and making your own as unconventional as, you know, you won't, might not find it in a book. But then also looking at, you know, uh, spiritual practices that are rooted in creativity. But I think, though, coming back to those conventional practices, these are foundational. These are things that if you, you know, or said, you know, somebody says, you know, name a spiritual practice, you can answer like that. It's what comes to mind here. They're not necessarily boring or uninteresting. I believe you can learn a lot in our faith. We can learn a lot about our connection with God, you know, through these practices. But these practices can help us build something that we can grow from. Or maybe combine together to make something new that connects us with our God. So there's ways that we can uh, use these foundational practices and to grow them into something new. So let's go to that next slide there. And so um, let's kind of go through a list of kind of some of you know, the basics. And again, some of you may know these things, and this is review, but uh, others that might be new for the first time, we're all on different points in our spiritual journeys. Uh, but for those who are in here, how many uh, prayers do I have? How many folks would say prayer is a gift, spiritual practice? Okay, I got several set. Oh, look at all, look at all these folks here. What the power of prayer in this room right here. Uh, for those who are, you know, who have that, you know, inclined to pray. Uh, how many um, pray in the morning? How many morning prayers? You got several morning prayers. Do I have several who pray in the evening? Got a few. All day. I got all day. Um, I will be honest here. My prayer life, I I could get distracted way too is easy, and so like I'll you know get in a moment where I'm you know, ready to pray, and a literal squirrel will be outside my window and I lose attention there for that moment. Uh, so I have found that for me in my prayer life, it comes very situationally. Uh, often like before I'm getting ready to go somewhere, getting into the car, you know, saying a prayer, you know, for say asking for a safe journey, but uh, especially if I'm gonna visit someone, ask for you know, God's blessing on who I'm gonna be visiting and seeing. So that's a way of incorporating prayer into your daily life right there. Um, especially like uh, in stressful situations i find myself really drawn to prayer then um, i have spent almost my entire life in in rural parts of the country and so as i've been in colorado springs the last three days i find myself praying a lot more in the car uh, as i'm in traffic so you know city traffic brings me to prayer <laughs> right there um, so there's all different ways we can find prayer in our lives, whether it's you know, structured at a certain time or just you know, as the Spirit moves in us. Uh, how many uh, studiers of the Bible are in here? Use this. All right. And, and Bible study is amazing. I think if there were two gifts or two practices, I feel like all people of faith should explore at least once. Uh, prayer and Bible study are those two because uh, we can learn so much from them and they're not you know, terribly difficult to get engaged with. Um, how many folks here do Bible study do it uh, in a group? Okay, got several. How many do it on, on your own, kind of individual studiers? Got some individual studiers. And since it's 2024, how many study the Bible online with others? Yeah, I got several here who do that. So there's different ways we can study the Bible. There's amazing tools out there. 
I find Bible study uh, is such a broad category as well because some, uh, you know, are really drawn to more the academic side of really getting into the text, the history of the text, of maybe uh, looking at the grammar that's there, or the historical context. Uh, Bible study can also bring us into more of the, you know, the matters of the heart. You know, what does the scripture say about my relationship with, you know, with my spouse, with my family, with my community? I mean, there's so many different ways we can, we can do Bible study and so many ways we can study the Bible. It can really be a springboard uh, for other practices as well. Uh, how many folks in here uh, love structure in their lives? Like you are like, bam, bam, I've got a calendar that's filled and I love structure. Anybody in here? I got a few. Yeah, I got a few love structure. How many just love chaos? <laughs> got a few that are just like, I am going with chaos, baby. Uh, um, you know, this is a pre this is something that I've had to work on because I tend I I like the idea of structure. <laughs> That's kind of where I start. That's about where it ends. But I find I'm a little more chaotic in my everyday life, and so uh, really setting aside structured time. For, for devotional. Maybe it's reading scripture, maybe reading the upper room uh, as in a classic devotion. But I think that devotional time can incorporate, you know, prayer, include Bible study, or so many ways you can do that. But having that set aside time uh, can be a real growing edge. I mean, you can grow uh, with that. I think Lent is a wonderful time to try that as we're in the season of Lent of, you know, it's 40 days plus Sundays that we can try something new that's structured as a start date, end date. And if we say at noon, I'm going to pray, um, just where the Holy Spirit leads. That's a, a way to get into that structured time, especially for my chaotic brothers and sisters there. Uh, for those of you who are amazing with structure, bring us along with you. You know, teach us the way of your calendaring uh, so we can move forward there. Uh, fasting, this is one of our kind of classic Methodist spiritual practices here. How many fasters do I have? Now I got some, I got some, no, no. <laughs> got a few, got a few there, yeah. Um, you know, fasting, I think, is a fascinating you know, spiritual practice there. And again, I'm kind of like, mm, not so much, um, you know, for me. But uh, fasting, when we associate it with food, but there's a lot of ways we can live it out. You know, maybe it is you know, abstaining from, from media for a while. Or maybe it is um, you know, abstaining you know, from something that uh, you know, takes away our time, like scrolling aimlessly on social media. You know, instead of you know, taking that time that we would scroll you know, on, on our phones, we fill it with something else, you know, with maybe we call a friend at that time, maybe we read the Bible at that time. There's a lot of ways you can approach fasting. I, I do always add this in here with fasting, uh, though, because um, I find it's important to consider is that if you're going to going some kind of medical treatment, say you're on prescription medicine, um, or you're going, undergoing a particular treatment, talk to your doctor before you do fasting with food. And there's nothing wrong if your doctor comes back and says, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, there's a lot of medical conditions that can get really wonky if you're fasting, you know, giving up meals for certain parts of the day. That is not a sign of weakness or that you are less than if you aspire to fasting and your doctor says, not with food. There's so many other ways you can uh, explore fasting of giving up things. Um, and I always add that there because uh, I don't think our spiritual practices should bring us you no know, harm to cause us to, to suffer. Like there, there's a difference between giving up something or maybe sacrificing a little bit as a growing edge, but there's a difference uh, and that's different from causing real lasting harm. So just be reminded of that, that your value as a child of God is not in your ability to fast. Your value is because God loves you and cares for you so much. Um, other kind of foundational practice is attending worship. Uh, this may seem basic right here. I am fortunate in that my occupation has me in worship one Sunday a, a week. You no, know, uh, so this is kind of pretty easy for me. Uh, others, you know, you've got a lot going on, and so you can kind of get off track. Uh, and, and I say no shame in this right here because there's a lot going on in our lives. 
uh, you know, family can live at a distance. You're, you know, spending time with them, which is important. But I also am aware of there are many in our uh, society who simply can't make it to worship because they're working. Um, I grew up in a community that uh, had an oil refinery. Uh, it was a major hub for the Union Pacific Railroad, had many manufacturers and, and, and foundries. Uh, and so a lot of folks had shift work. You know, they were, when it was their time to work, they had to work. Um, and I also think about our, our first responders, you know, police, firefighters, EMS, uh, and especially where in, in communities where they're, you know, they're paid, um, you know, and, and that is their full-time job. You know, they're not able to worship sometimes on Sunday mornings. So if you find yourself, you know, in that position where your work uh, has you working, and when your church is worshiping, I would encourage you to reach out to your pastor about maybe setting up a time of worship or maybe creating a practice of worship. Oh. Oh, oh, he did. Got a, oh, wait, that's right. We're on Zoom right now. Ooh. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so the question there for adding a spiritual practice and stopping something, I think so. I, I, would, I would encourage that. Uh, I think taking on uh, uh, an act of, I'll kind of get to here in a bit, but like adding on an act of service or adding on, um, you know, maybe calling your neighbors, um, checking on folks instead of maybe watching TV. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can do that. So yes, absolutely. Uh, I would support that. Uh, but going, yeah, I kind of tied into this thought here on the attending worship piece. Um, I also think it's a calling for us as a people of faith to meet people where they are. And so if you have a significant number of people in your community that simply aren't able to make it to worship on Sunday mornings, uh, that may be an opportunity for you to reach out and maybe find a time of worship that would work you know, for others as well. Having an alternative time of worship can be an amazing life-giving opportunity for people. So keep that in mind. Uh, the next kind of thing to talk about there is keeping the Sabbath. Um, I remember a mentor of mine when I was much younger in ministry uh, spoke to me about the importance of keeping the Sabbath in that if our God, the creator of heavens and earth and all the creatures can take a day off, so can you, Travis Walker. Um, and I think that keeping a Sabbath is important. Um, I know it is for me because it reminds me that I'm not in control, that I'm not driving the bus the world is in. It reminds me to connect with God. My Sabbath for me is Friday. And the weeks that I find where I'm having to, you know, work or, or be with others, uh, I shift that. And so I would encourage you to have a practice of Sabbath, of finding a time where you are connecting with God, where you can rest to, you know, worship, to connect, you know, keeping that Sabbath and, and being open to moving that if you need to as well. Uh, going with our question online from our folks who are on Zoom, uh, absolutely, I think um, adding a spiritual practice here, this is a natural one, is of service. How many folks here do I have who have, excuse me, uh, have regularly scheduled volunteer service in their community? Got a few, yeah. There's so many ways you can serve in the community. Uh, you know, food pantries, you know, prison ministry. I know help. You no, know, uh, I've got a, a, a guy in my Wiley Church who drives veterans to appointments. That's one of his ministry uh, to medical appointments. There's so many ways service can be. Uh, it could be, you know, your neighbor across the street. You've heard that they're um, struggling to get the lawn mowed, and you just go over and just take care of it for them. You know, that what an act of service that could be right there, and that can be a spiritual practice uh, there. Are there any other practices that I've missed that might be helpful? Skip. Well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that's actually coming right. Now. Great. Thank you for the segue, Skip. I appreciate it there. Um, we'll go to the next slide here real quick. Um, and so one of the things I think we have these conventional practices, but there's ways that we can grow with them. We can grow into something new and connect different parts of our lives as a part of spirituality. Uh, so Skip was mentioning photography. Um, so a friend of mine uses the word vocation to describe his callings and living to certain vocations. Uh, he would describe himself, you know, his first vocation is that of being a husband and a father. The next vocation is that of being a farmer who lives in Western Nebraska. And his third vocation is that of being a church musician. And so he sees you know, his calling, his ability to live out his faith you know, in those ways. And for me, I would say, you know, my vocations you know that of husband, and being a, a member of my family, um, vocation of you know, pastoring. But for me, photography is one of my vocations. In fact, all the pictures you've seen in this PowerPoint have been ones that I've taken, uh, either around my home or other trips we've been on. And so for me, this is where I find joy of being, of being present, of using you know, the foundations you know, from those practices and connecting it with our world and to grow in that. My unconventional thought here is there are these practices that I hadn't thought of that before, you know, the kind of synthesizing, bringing ideas, parts of our lives together and forming a spiritual practice some of these things may look conventional, but they may look different. Um, these are all ways, though, of connecting our faith to where we are in the moment, to where we are, being open to connecting with God and with the Holy Spirit. So let's go on to the next slide here. And I find that when we're building out our own practice, you know, building out our unconventional practices that we have synthesized with our lives, with our experience, I find if we can connect our senses to our spiritual practices, it can bring us more into the moment. Uh, how many senses do we have? Five, seven, or some debate there. The thing of the basic ones we learned, you know, when we're young, you know, we have taste, sight, sound, smell, and touch right there. I'm sorry, I had to stop and think for that one was there. Uh, so we have those basics, you know, we can maybe take um, how we see things, how we perhaps uh, hear things, and incorporate that into our spiritual practices. You know, what do we hear in our lives, and how do we connect that with Scripture and with the movement of the Spirit? I also find that connecting with nature can be a way of you know, connecting with those senses, but also connecting our faith. I'm not much of a morning person. I, I like the idea of mornings, again. Uh, I will get up in the morning, but I like to wake up. You know, I'm not like, it's time to go do something. I'm like, I need my coffee, sit for a minute, and then I can go do my day. And so in the summer, you know, for me, it's, you know, I get up, make my coffee, go sit on the back porch before it's 150 degrees outside, and just enjoy watching the birds come. And one of the ways I would say I connect in that present moment is watching these little guys here, these hummingbirds that come to our yard. And this is a little hummingbird that was in our yard this past summer. And, you know, hummingbirds, I believe, are great for connecting with our senses because you can see them. They have all kinds of color on them. You can hear them as they're flying. Now, you may not smell a hummingbird, but you can perhaps, you know, get a scent of the honeysuckle, you know, that's attracted to you right there. And I'm reminded of kind of those moments, you know, again, of how God, you know, cares for the birds of the air, and God cares for me as well. Some of my most profound spiritual moments have just simply been in those quiet moments watching, and whatever comes, comes. And maybe I feel a movement of the spirit. Maybe I'm just simply awake and able to go about my day. But for me, that time in the morning with my cup of coffee on the back porch, that is a spiritual practice for me as much as it is, you know, attending worship or reading the Bible or praying. It helps me connect with God. I also think in our day and age, in this epidemic of loneliness that we are encountering, that having spiritual practices that connect with others can be incredibly life-giving. There is a group of older gentlemen 
that meet in the Wiley Church. This happened before I got in the scene. They actually met in a different church up until just recently. They come and have coffee on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., and that's all they do. And they are retired gentlemen, and in fact, they call themselves the old guys coffee time. I have a really hard time with it, and when they started meeting at the church, I was like, and announcing it on Sunday morning, I'm like, folks, I did not give them this name. This is the name they have. But it is a practice for them to get together, to share what's going on in their lives, you know, share a donut, a cup of coffee, and to connect, and it's life-giving for those guys that come and simply have that social contact with each other. A lot of widowers there. Um, so it's just an amazing life-giving ministry for them. Life-giving for me when I when they had on Donut Wednesday when I poked my head in right there. But so yeah, it's, I love donuts. Won't lie. Uh, <laughs> I also think as we're thinking about our practices, it can be a bit unconventional having the opportunity for reflection, that opportunity to reflect on on what God is doing, you know, in life, what God might be leading me towards, what God might be assuring me. Opportunities for, lecture, for reflection are critical. Our last bit here, and I know I'm aware of our time as well. I appreciate y'all hanging with me, especially in the afternoon. But I think something that can be really beneficial for us in connecting with the present moment and experiencing joy in our being is creativity. How many folks in here would say they are creative? We've got a few. How many would say no? Yeah, a few. That's all right. I think we're all kind of, you know, different places in how we reflect that. However, I do think we all have some creativity uh, in us, and we can use creativity in our spiritual practices. And the list I have here is not exhaustive by any means. They're just ideas, and I uh, left a few uh, pra create creative practices here that could go up. But I'm going to use an example here of art. Um, I am not an artist by any means, like uh, formally trained. Like I, use, I love a camera and I've learned art you know, through photography, uh, but I have no formal training in art. But I have found a meaningful practice for, for people and for myself at times has simply been to take a pencil and to challenge myself that every day for the next week, I will take a scripture and write my reflection as a picture. So let's take Psalm 4610 for a minute. Be still and know that I am God. You get a pencil out or a pen, whatever you got handy, nothing fancy, and you draw whatever comes to you in that moment. And you do it for a week. And, and you're not creating the next Picasso or Rembrandt in this. You're just simply being in that moment and seeing just where the Spirit takes you, what speaks to you in that moment. I think that can be incredibly life-giving. Now, some folks in here I know may be a visual artist. Uh, you may have uh, you know, training or that's a, a, a life-giving hobby for you. I would you know, encourage you to, to use your art as a spiritual practice, incorporate that into your life. Um, music, how many musicians do I have in here? Got a few, all right. Um, so my musical experience is that my mother and grandmother are church musicians, organists and pianists. And when I was ready for piano lessons, I was that obstinate child that said, no, that's what you all do. It did not end well for me uh, when I said that. Um, but I did uh, find a love for music uh, in band. And so I'm a trombone and tuba player, way more tuba than trombone now. And so one of the practices that I've done I did it several years ago for Lent, was I pulled out our, our hymnal, and I would play a hymn a day during the month of Lent. And that was good for me because it helped me learn treble clef a little bit better, because tuba does not play in treble clef, and if I wanted to have any semblance of a melody in a spiritual practice, I had to learn treble clef. So for musicians, I would encourage you to try that. Uh, for those who would say you're not a musician, not musical at all, I mean, uh, Find you know, uh, some music to listen to. Uh, maybe find classical music, maybe some contemporary Christian music, and just listen to that and just be in that moment listening of how you're feeling the spirit. What is this music teaching you about faith? And maybe commit to that for a week or for a season and see where that takes you. 
Uh, Skip mentioned uh, photography, and I, you know that's one for me that has been incredibly life-giving. Uh, how many crafters do I have in here? Got several. How many uh, like buying craft supplies? <laughs> Got several of those in here. That's all right. They're both hobbies. They are both separate hobbies. Sometimes they come together. Uh, I say that jokingly, but uh, um, I think crafting is one of those that can be incredibly spiritual as well. Uh, I've known so many churches that uh, do have a knitting ministry. Uh, one church I served in particular, they had a, a ministry that for folks in their community, as they were getting ready for chemotherapy or for dialysis, they would knit a full-length blanket for them so they could have that. And so it was so life-giving for those who were going through treatment. They, had a, they would you know, play, pray over the, the blanket, bless it. And so they're incorporating not only their, you know, their abilities, their, their knitting, but also praying and, and acts of service right there. It was life-giving for so many. Um, writers, have you writers in here? Got a few, okay. Maybe you're just writing your reflections, writing in a journal of you know, your, your encounters with scripture, your encounters with the Holy Spirit, or, or things that spoke to you in your day. Maybe you do poetry with that. Maybe you write a play. I uh, had one person earlier that said they were a playwright. I was like, awesome. You know, how amazing that could be, you know, at, you know, writing a play for stories from Scripture. I don't want to have on here, and it was not intentional, but you know, dramatic arts could be a creative practice of living out faith. Um, dance could be one. Are there any other creative practices that I have not mentioned? Uh-huh. Uh, when I first started getting interested in the in homelessness and mm -hmm. the youth and so mm -hmm. my practice was to go around and find mm -hmm. these kids mm -hmm. wherever they were and just engage in the Absolutely. And that they're more than willing to tell you their story mm -hmm. or get up to a desk and and maybe not even ask. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Connecting with people, especially you know, folks you know um, uh, they dare to use that phrase, you know, on the margins of society. I just connecting, um, you know, connecting with people, hearing their stories. Um, um, it's amazing just what conversation can do, and it is a spiritual practice. I would agree with that. So thank you for yes yeah, sharing that. Absolutely. Any other creative practices stand out? Well, again, I'm aware of our time, so I'm going to kind of wrap this up. Uh, if you want to jump to that last slide uh, on our presentation there, with kind of my information. Um, for next steps, though, I encourage you to really think about how can you connect the present moment with your faith? How can you find joy in the present moment? Is it through prayer? Is it through Bible study? Is it through, through painting pictures? Or is it through you know, connecting with others? and incorporate that you know, into your spiritual life. Uh, I believe having uh, joy in our everyday present moments is life-giving. It's an incredible witness, and it builds up the people of God, and it builds up ourselves so incredibly much. Uh, this is my contact information up here. You are welcome to get in touch with me if you have any questions at all. Um, and I'll just add here uh, two things. One, my Instagram is up there, so if you want to see more pictures that I've done, uh, you're welcome just to look there. I kind of use Instagram the most of my social media channels. Um, and if you're ever passing through Wiley, please holler. I'd love to, to chat with you. I'll make a cup of coffee for you. If you're not of the coffee persuasion, I've got some water or something else, I'll find it for you. I'd love to have a conversation. And I also hope to connect with you where you are, as well as I uh, learn and grow into this new role as CRM. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you so much for giving up time on your Saturday to be here, to connect, to be present. Uh, and may you be a blessing. 
for others in the community as you have been blessed by God. So go in peace. Thank you. And thank you to our folks upstairs who have been running all this. Uh, so appreciate you all. Thank you. So that's at the Cheyenne Mountain Zero. Yeah, that's at the Cheyenne Mountain Zero. It was way about, you know, back in there. That's close to know.